Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I spoke at a conference in Boston this week. Uh, on the way up, I got to see my old pal and one of my very first podcast guests, Paul DeFilippo. Uh, on the way home, I got some insane news from FDA that's going to involve me earning my pay for my trade association members, but it's an occasion for me to practice some diplomacy and, and big thinking, which I, I sort of enjoy. And next week, I'll be in Frankfurt for a conference for a few days, also for the Trade Association. Uh, that's Frankfurt, Germany, not the capital of Kentucky, which is Frankfurt. Um, no plans to record with anybody while I'm over there, just landing on a red eye, doing business for two or three days, and then flying straight home. Might be recording with the artist illustrator Anita Kunz the day after I'm back. Uh, we were supposed to do one in Toronto this spring, but weren't able to get together. So I'm hoping we'll be able to pull that off while she's here in New York, but haven't finalized anything. All of which is okay, because I still have a whole bunch of episodes in waiting and uh, a lot of guests tentatively scheduled for later in November and December. So um, it is my hope we're never going to have a dead week until I take a couple of weeks off between Christmas and New Year's. This week, you get the one live episode I recorded at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, or CXC, in September. There were supposed to be two live episodes there, but there is a story, which I will share with you later on about that. Uh, my guest this time around is the cartoonist Ho Che Anderson. Now, I knew about Ho's work since the 90s, uh, but we only met last year at Toronto Comic Arts Festival when he had a, a new book out, Godhead from Fantagraphics. Uh, at the time, uh, he's a Toronto resident. At the time, I pitched him on recording a podcast, but I wasn't sure when we'd cross paths again, since he's not a regular at TCAF. That's usually the only time of year I, I get up to Toronto. So I was happy when the CXC people asked me to moderate the spotlight session with Ho during their, their festival. Now, like I said, Ho's been around a long time, publishing primarily with Fantagraphics, but also with other comics publishers. He's best known for a three-part graphic biography of Martin Luther King Jr. entitled King. Uh, that is a fantastic piece of biography. Um, the drawing is gorgeous. It's, as a story, kind of blows up the mythology that, that's built up around MLK and shows the reader a, a more flawed human King. And, and as we talk about during the episode, that makes his achievements even more impressive. Now, Ho's new book, Godhead, is not a biography of Martin Luther King. It is a science fiction adventure story, and we get into it a bunch during the episode, so I won't talk about it too much here. I will say it's a lot of fun. There are hints of, of Tarantino, Blade Runner, Heinlein Starship Troopers, all sorts of other neat influences, as well as a kind of heavy theological component, uh, since the plot centers around this device that a corporation has built that lets users commune directly with God. Godhead came out in 2018, and I'm not quite sure when the conclusion will be out. This is part one, uh, the edition that, of the first book that's come out from Fantagraphics, but it's great that Ho Che Anderson is making comics, as, as well as movies, which he talks about during the episode too. Uh, now, as far as caveats go, like I said, we recorded this one live at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus with an audience, and I didn't have a mic on the audience, so the three or four questions that they ask aren't as loud as I'd like. You could still hear them, and they're generally easy to figure out based on Ho's responses. Now, here's his bio. 
Ho-Che Anderson is a Canadian cartoonist living in Toronto. He was launched into the comic scene with the publication of his erotic story, I Want to Be Your Dog, in 1990. He next embarked on the project he is best known for, King, his three-part comic series on the life of civil rights leader Martin Luther King, Jr., his other works include the graphic story collections Young Hoods in Love and Pop Life, in collaboration with cartoonist Wilfred Santiago, and the graphic novels Scream Queen and Sand and Fury. His newest book is Godhead, from Fantagraphics. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Ho Che Anderson. Uh, so let's actually start with Godhead. Okay. Um, I read about it on and off over the years in interviews. It, it, it was dead in, in 2010. Yes, it uh, you was. Were it's alive now. There's it a first is. volume out from Fanta. Tell us more about it, and it's it's life and death, or death and ah, life. Wow. Okay, well, um, I first got the idea for Godhead, uh, I guess, around... Um, Oh, 1999, 2000, thereabouts. Um, what, so the reason that the story came about was um, I realized that I had not uh, created like um, an original story for quite some time. I'd been working on my King biography and uh, corporate illustrations and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I hadn't really like kind of explored my own creative muse for a while. Um, so I started thinking I wanted to tell a story about, oh, thank you so much. I wanted to tell a story about, I wanted to do a crime story. And I was going to tell a story. I wanted to do a crime story called uh, Morris Minor, which is just going to be about a neighborhood dude and gets caught up in stuff, forces beyond his control. And at the same time, um, I was uh, also making my living, part of my living, as an illustrator. And uh, they have these things in the illustration world. I don't know if they still exist. Uh, times have changed somewhat. But they used to have a thing called a mailer where you would uh, put together images into a little publication and send them out to art directors to try and get work. And um, I was doing, like I said, a little bit of corporate illustration. I wanted to kind of do more of that because it was lucrative in the illustration world. And um, uh, so I was working on those two things separately. And over time, um, they just started to kind of naturally merge in, in, in my own mind. Um, and, then, and then September 11 happened. And suddenly the North America in general, Americans specifically, became a very kind of martial um, uh, there's a very martial atmosphere sure. in the air, needless to say. Um, so those three things kind of came together, and uh, God had kind of emerged. So the crime story element, um, the, the story is about uh, a corporation uh, which creates a machine which allows the user to, use, to talk to God. Uh, it's a little bit of an out there concept. And the, so the, the corporate illustration aspect of the story became uh, the character of the CEO, um, which is he's the, the CEO of the company which has created the God Machine. And the Morris Minor, the crime story element of it, uh, start manifested it in uh, the antagonist, or not the antagonist, but the co-lead of the story, Racer Calhoun. Um, he, he sort of became the crime aspect of it. And it sort of became a story of I guess uh, the corporate elite in in conflict with the underclass, if you will, um, with uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, you know how corporations kind of dominate our lives and how religion has like control over our lives. Um, so yeah, those all those elements kind of combine to create this story. And over twenty years, it started well, to, to grow as a comic. Well, what happened was I, I I so I came up with this story and I was very excited about it. And I started pitching it. I, I thought, I'm going to start at the top. Um, so I pitched it to Marvel and DC. And I got people, I got editors in both companies who, were, who really wanted to do the book. But every time it got to, the, to their bosses, their bosses always said no. And I was like, OK, I've seen these guys take chances on indie artists before. What is it about my work that is like, you know, what is the barrier with, with my work? Um, I was trying not to think it had anything to do with skin color, but who the hell knows? And so I pitched it. I was going to say Canadian, which well, is our new <laughs> thing, but go on. Yeah, <laughs> that might have had something to do with it. But um, I, uh, so I pitched it to Marvel. I had a guy there who really wanted to do it. Then it fell apart. I pitched it to DC. I had a guy there who really wanted to do it. He went so far as to, like, to, you know, he wrote a whole synopsis to take to his, his bosses. And I was so happy that somebody had invested this much in the story. I thought we got to go project here. And they said no. 
I don't know what to do. So I, I pitched it to everybody. I pitched it to Dark Horse. I pitched it to all the indies, and I got no, no, no. I thought, what am I, what am I doing wrong here? Um, it was uh, that was the moment where I thought, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe there's no future for me in the comic book industry. Maybe it's time to move out of it, which is what I started to do. And I just put Godhead to the side. But um, I don't know what happened over time. It uh, it had taken up so I was so passionate about the story, and it had been in my brain for such a long time that I just felt. There was no way I'm, I need to free it from my brain. I needed the, the mental real estate is what we're trying to gotcha. say. So I had to get the thing done just so that I could think about something else and move on from it. So um, finally, I, I just decided to take it to Fantagraphics, who also were, who had been my longtime publisher, and even they were somewhat reluctant about publishing the thing, which is really surprising. But they came around. They published the thing. It's finally out there. I like I think about other things for a change, and uh, yeah, it's only volume good. one so far. You've volume still got one. I've still got book. about 120 pages of volume two to draw. So. Volume one's real good. It's it's. Thanks. You sold copies downstairs. I sold a ton of copies actually. Awesome. Yeah. And you'll be signing some also for I people. Will, absolutely. Um, and original art from Godhead. If anybody cares to take a peek, it's right here for the for the viewing. And volume two timeline. Um, time frame? Well, I went from. You know, somebody who couldn't get arrested in the comic book industry to somebody who suddenly was getting a, a lot of a lot of work thrown my way. So I, I'm not sure what changed in the ensuing years, but it, it's just I've seemed to have rounded a corner. So uh, I have a lot of time, as much time as I used to have to work on this book. Um, been like doing things that actually pay. Um, so uh, it's going to be a little less. well. Yeah, comics don't pay, man. It's I know. been you know been doing a lot of work outside of the industry, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's on the way. I, I still produce pages every week, and you know it's it's getting there. So we can no longer refer to you as a frustrated cartoonist. You're, you cannot. You're, okay, I'm actually <laughs> somewhat dissatisfied cartoonist for for once. In <laughs> Irascible career. cartoonist, but still, you know, <laughs> you know, and and frustrated filmmaker also, or no actually, longer. Actually, no. My um, yeah, I'm sort of got one foot in, in filmmaking film. and one foot in in, in cartooning, and uh, for whatever reason, the filmmaking world has always embraced me uh, more enthusiastically than the comic book world ever has. So, hmm. and that's where I've actually been able to make more of a living. So. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. Can you talk about your your visual style or styles and and how they've developed over time? Sure. Especially with something like Godhead that's taken time right, to make. Right. Also, how you how you change over the course of that? But. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm, I um I've described myself in the past as being um, something of a magpie, and that I will. I listen. My ambition has never really, honestly, to been like a, to be original per se. It's more my ambition has always been to just be good at what I do. So I have always kind of I've ripped people off left, right, and center. Never had any problem doing that. I never will have a problem doing that. I've always worn my influences very much on my sleeve. Um, I think I, I don't worry about that kind of thing so much because even though you, even though an artist or a writer, whomever, a creative person will emulate the people that they admire, um, just by virtue of the fact that my hand is creating the stuff, uh, it will it will reflect who I am, whether I wanted to or not. Um, so I just I just sort of let let you know let the chips fall where they may in, in that regard. But um, I am very influenced by. Um, uh, Howard Chaikin is like one of my big influences. Uh, Who I, I emailed before this to, to see if he had any questions for you, but he says no. Just give him my best. So. <laughs> you emailed Chaikin about me. That's uh, we, we did an episode together a couple oh, of years awesome. ago, and it's one of the weirdest things in my life. Now is that Howard Chaikin and I will just occasionally email about yeah. like Glow on Netflix and things like that. It, it's yeah, but. Chaikin's fascinating. Yeah, uh, yeah and it's funny because um, for many years I uh, I always. And ironically, this is something I got from Chaikin. Don't ever meet your heroes. He said uh, in one of uh, an issue of American Flag, it's just like meeting your heroes is, is brutal. But when I finally got to interact with Chaikin, I've never met him, but we've spoken many times, yeah. and we email each other as well. And when I finally met him, he was just... And, you know, if anybody knows Howard Chaikin, he's, like, he's kind of a legendary curmudgeon. And uh, so when I met him, or when I, when I finally communicated with him, I was expecting him to be kind of an asshole. And uh, he was so warm and gracious and such a sweet guy and uh and it's kind of it's surreal for me to you know be in tangential contact contact yeah. with like this yeah. person who i've admired so intensely for like you know, 25 years and uh, anyway um so I, i've stolen a lot from chaikin 
stolen a lot from uh, from from Frank Miller, the Hernandez brothers, from Kyle Baker. Um, but I also am a big fan of um, of illustration, um, uh, like especially American illustration from the twenties, thirties, forties, and. Uh, Movie production art is a big thing with me. Uh, I've, I, I've taken influences from, from, many, from many spheres and tried to kind of synthesize it into my work. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm a bit of a magpie when it comes to my approach. And what was your entry point to comics? Star Wars. Yeah? It was Star Wars. There's Again, nothing going back wrong to with Jake. that. Shaken well, yeah, okay, to the adaptation. to the adaptation. So I yeah. saw, my mother took me to see Star Wars. I was seven years old. I walked into the movie, one person, and I came out a complete, oh, my mind is, I'm still picking up the pieces. And uh, I came out a totally different person, and um, I was obsessed with that film. That film introduced me to the content. I always like to draw a little bit, but that introduced me to the idea of visual storytelling, which is what I'm obsessed with to this day, which is why I always kind of wanted to get into films as well as comic books, because they were both, there's transferable skills, and they're both like telling stories through images. Um, so it was uh, it was the film that kind of uh, that you know did a number on me, and then reading Chaikin's adaptation when I was a child got me into comic books specifically. Um, and the thing about comics, and as opposed to films, were unless you were lucky enough to have somebody in your life who had a camera, um, filmmaking is like it's this ephemeral thing. It's so hard to sort of find an entry point into. Whereas any kid who's ever seen a pencil and a piece of paper can draw a comic book if they so are so inclined. Um, and I wanted to sort of transport those images I had seen on the screen, uh, sort of make my versions of them. So I just picked up a piece of paper and I started drawing stuff and writing stupid little stories and, uh, and I haven't stopped doing it in, you know, 40 years, however long it's been. So The years do pile up on us. <laughs> Unfortunately, they do, yes. Is it art training at all or were you pretty much... Teaching yourself through I'm the, teaching uh, myself. I did do um, I did do a little bit of. Uh, I used to go to like weekend art school when I was a little kid, and I was excelled at, in art class um, when I was you know when I was in grade school and high school that kind of thing. But by the time I decided that I wanted to be a professional, I'd already been drawing obsessively for years. Mm -hmm. So I just never really saw the point in spending money to go to school to learn how to do something that I was quite capable of learning on my own. Um, I, I wound up going to film school just because it's it, I couldn't figure out how to yeah, do it any the other way. The technical craft of that it's, is a exactly. lot different. Than, but yeah. comics, you yeah. just need to look at them and be able to practice them, and you can develop the skills if you, if you choose to do so. So, uh, yeah, not, not much in terms of technical training. Did you get encouragement from professional cartoonists? Was there anyone you showed your, uh, your stuff to when you were coming up? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, this is a deep cut. Um, in the 80s, there used to be a comic book in, published out of Toronto called Mr. X. Oh, yeah. It seemed Dean like you, you might yeah. have heard of yeah. that Yeah, and the, the Hernandez brothers the got Hernandez screwed Hernandez brothers on, on producing that. Yeah. Monumentally screwed. And I, I, so, and, uh, so I, I, I used to go to a comic book store. It's no longer around in, in Toronto. And, um, and I bought, you know, I used to buy those Mr. X's, and I found out that, uh, you know, they were published in Toronto. So I was like 14 years old, and I took my, you know, kind of broken down portfolio with my terrible drawings. I had no drawing skill whatsoever at 14, but I had a lot of ambition, and I had a lot of chutzpah. So I took, uh, I took my stuff down to the Vortex offices. I was there. It was like, you know, I went there at nighttime and didn't expect to see anybody there because I had to go to school in the daytime. And yeah. I went there in the evening time. And, and uh, a very nice lady kind of let me in, and she showed her stuff to some of her bosses. Not, not the big boss, Bill Marks, who screwed the Hernandez brothers, but um, just uh, one of the other people there. And uh, they I'm maze downstairs. We could oh, bring him I up know. here. And oh, he was, he was I've been about, about dying to talk to him about that, actually, but I haven't had the opportunity yet. But uh, I, I intend to see his, get his side of the story. But um, I, uh, So I took my stuff. They were encouraging, but they basically told me to take a walk. And then two years later, kept practicing, went back, 16 years old, and... Um, they welcomed me in. Dean Motter, I knocked on the door again. They had switched offices. Dean Motter opened the door, the writer of uh, Mr. X, writer-creator of Mr. X. And he, used to, he did some work for DC. He did a, a prisoner adaptation in the, oh, yeah. in the yeah, 80s, in the I believe, 80s. late 80s, yeah. absolutely, with uh, Mark Asquith. Yeah. And uh, Dean Motter opened the door, looked at me like I was a freak, but he let me come in. And I met, Dean, I met uh, Bill Marks, and I met uh, the cartoonist Seth. And uh, Seth, um, I remember I met Seth, and... Uh, anybody here familiar with Seth? Um, 
Excellent. And you, so you're very familiar with this kind of 1920s, 30s aesthetic. Well, back then, he was more in league with what was going on in the 1980s, so he had this massive shock of Robert Smith like yeah, hair. Yeah, he, he had the white hair for a he while, He had too. white hair, dude. Yeah. He had this yeah, had massive blue, Robert Smith yeah, white hair. Thing. He had the, these black gloves. He had a gray suit, and he looked he was striking. Like, I was kind of in love with the guy. Like, he was just such a cool looking dude. Yeah. And um, so he's like, uh, he welcomed me in and he gave me a lot of encouragement. And he used, to, and, uh, uh, and then after that, um, uh, a few months later, uh, I'd been involved with, like, you know, Vortex for maybe about two or three months. And they, me, Seth, Bill Marks, um, and uh, the cartoonist Chester Brown loaded into uh, Bill Marks's tiny, ego trip of a sports car um, to drive down to a Detroit uh, a comics convention. And uh, that was, so that was kind of my introduction to, like, you know, the Toronto indie comic scene. And they were all super encouraging guys, even douchebag Bill, Mar Bill Marks. He was, like, he, he was even nice about, about me coming in. But you weren't drawing for them at that point? You were sort of a... No, they sort of took me on as an apprentice. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would, like, go in every couple of weeks. I would work on stuff. They'd give me advice, encouragement, uh, criticism. I'd come back. I'd, and I was showing constant improvement. So they saw, they saw me as, like, somebody that they could invest in in the future. And, and then I started pitching them things. They accepted something of mine. They encouraged me to write and draw uh, like a like a first issue of a five issue like miniseries. Uh, didn't pay me a dime. Uh, made me a ton of promises and then pulled the rug out from under me. Which Welcome was to the, comics, kid. <laughs> exactly. It was a good baptism by fire. And it's sort of the Bill Marks way. He was uh, just not a good guy. But um, yeah. Anyway, so that was that was kind of my intro into the into the field mm -hmm. yeah. and then you came up through fantagraphics a few yes. years later in the mid 90s absolutely so i did a bunch of work for bill like i said never got paid for any of it um and then none of it ever got published and because uh i don't like to take crap you know uh as most of us don't uh and was vocal about not wanting to take crap i sort of developed a bit of a bad rep with mm -hmm. um the uh with the the uh, vortex people they i thought they were asses and they thought i was an ass and I can't say that they were wrong, to be yeah. honest with you. So um, I finally um, I, I pitched some stuff to uh, uh, to Fantagraphics. Didn't hear anything back from them. I was pitching to everybody. This was like uh, the very late 80s, 88, 89, thereabouts. And, um, and then uh, Howard Chaikin created a book called uh, Black Hiss. It's like uh, one of the first erotic, mainstream erotic comics, also published by Vortex. So and the, that, the, the ironic thing about that is, A, mainstream, given what some of the content is in that. Well, and exactly. And B, erotic, given some of the content. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it is a, a sexy comic by, yeah, by Howard, though. Yeah, 100%. It's a very transgressive. Oh, yeah. Well, Chaykin, at the time, especially. Chaykin, well, I think yeah. still to this day, to be honest with you. Um, the, yeah, definitely ahead of its time, for sure. Mm -hmm. Chaykin has always sort of swum in, uh, in interesting waters. But... Um, and has never been afraid, which I've always appreciated about him. But anyway, the success of Black Kiss gave rise to uh, Fantagraphics creating um, a line of comic, erotic comics, so-called, uh, called Eros Comics. Uh, not only, and I think that was looked at um, by Fantagraphics as a means of staying afloat because they were deep in the weeds and yeah. they were they were about to go out of business. And Eros Comics sort of gave them a, a shot of uh, financial adrenaline. So. Um, out of the blue one day, like I said, I never heard anything back from uh, Gary when I when I pitched him some stuff. Out of the blue one day, I got a letter in the mail announcing the arrival of, uh, of uh, Eros Comics, uh, looking for new cartoonists. Uh, are you interested? Hell yeah, I'm interested. So, um, so I kind of lost the point of my story. But anyway, um, how that's kind of how I, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I uh, so I said yeah. I, I, I came up with a pitch. Uh, I actually called them and I said, is this serious? They said, yeah. I came up with a pitch, I sent it in, and then I got a call back a few weeks later from Gary Groth. And uh, I was a little nervous because by this point I was a regular Comics Journal reader. I hope you guys know what the Comics Journal is. Um, it doesn't exist in print anymore, I don't I think. I think they still do one every couple of years. Is that right? Oh, yeah. okay. That's yeah, like at the booth, I think they still have a, or table, they still have oh. a couple... They did one with uh, Tommy Unger and, and Gary, like, oh, last year. So. Okay, all right, that's yeah. interesting. I, I thought they were strictly online at this point. Yeah, but I think there's... Just every now and then they'll yeah. do one. Okay, great. Uh, go, but when I go back to the table, I'm going to check them out. Mm -hmm. But um, at any rate, um, I, I, was, I was a regular reader of the journal, and uh, 
I had heard, all you heard is like, you know, in the surrounding press was Gary Groth, also an asshole. All right. It's like a lot of like not my, cool people I'm like running into. So my first like, Gary uh, exposure was an editorial in the Comics Journal about right. a guy who was doing um, uh, celebrity comics. And uh, the title of the editorial was Todd Loren Fleming, First Amendment Advocate or Lying Sack of Shit. Yes. That was, that I was remember very, that. Yes. And, yeah, it was an Alan Moore cover. <laughs> that was the first exposure yeah. I had to. Well, that's Gary's Gary in a nutshell. <laughs> so I was, when I got the call, I was like, D. Gary Groth. And I was like, yeah, I'm Gary Groth. And I was expecting to, you know, the two-headed beast that I'd yeah. heard so much about from people. And again, sort of like shaking. He was the warmest, sweetest guy. Mm -hmm. Both of those guys have always been nothing but just very, just totally cool with me. And uh, so I fell in love with the guy. And um, so we've just been working together for all these years since. Yeah. And going from an Eros book to biography of Martin Luther King? Yes. Well, it Nate was... Nate Powell was here, by the way, just now in the previous oh, cool. session. So I don't know if you guys rumble over doing Martin Luther King versus... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Nate kicked the crap out of me about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he took me outside and he gave me a thorough beating. But uh, we, John we, Lewis we King, to, you know, you just Yeah, rumble. it was, it was yeah. brutal. But, uh, you know, we came to an understanding. But, um, yeah, no... Uh, uh, yeah, well, what happened was, um, you know, I didn't make any, I didn't make any, you know, secret of the fact that I was a black cartoonist. One fool called me an openly black cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> but you were passing. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. But uh, at any rate, um, so uh, <laughs> so I didn't make any secret of that. And um, so what happened was, uh, uh, I think in like our first or second conversation. Um, Gary said, uh, listen, I want to do a, a series of um, historical comic books. Uh, I love Martin Luther King and his legacy, and I really want to start the line with, with King. Are you interested? Now, I've been trying to break into comics for, gosh, since this was 1989 or 1990, and I've been trying to break in seriously since 1986, 84, 85, 86. Um, so for somebody to say, yes, I'm going to green light this one comic, and do you want to do a second one for me? Mm -hmm. I've arrived, man. I'm the man. So uh, I, told, I said, absolutely, I'll do it. And uh, yeah, not really fully realizing what I was getting myself into <laughs> or that uh, this thing was going to follow me around for like the next 20-plus like, years but uh, become my, my lasting legacy as a cartoonist. But uh, yeah, I was grateful to get the job and to be able to dive into those waters that I sort of knew about the civil rights movement. You can't grow up as a black person yeah. without having some understanding of it. But being Canadian, was it a different context well, for you? Absolutely, it was. Because um, you know, we saw what was going on in the States as, you know, we're observing it as outsiders. Yeah. And it's not that we were so far removed uh, that we didn't have any I mean, resonance, but it was still like, you know, this happened over the border. Um, so it, for me, it was a I sort of grown up hearing about the stories and knowing a little bit about the civil rights movement, but it wasn't something that I had a deep personal connection to. And um, so I was intimidated, but also uh, very excited to be able to actually take a deep dive into those waters and form my own perspective on, on, on them. And also, I've always been fascinated by the United States and there's a certain mythic quality that the States has always had that uh, Canada doesn't quite have that same flavor to it. Yeah. So uh, it it's was America's just... America's uh, hat. It's okay. Well, it's okay. you know what? Your country was formed by revolution and our country was formed by writing, you know, making a deal. You know, so uh, you know we're good negotiators, but we're not so good with the gun. And um, so it was well, actually, we're pretty damn good with the gun these days. But um, anyway, the point is, uh, I would always been an admirer of the states, and I just wanted to tell a story that was just a quintessentially an American story. And did having that long form project, I assume a contract for a long form project, you know, get you drawing more and more regularly in that? Yeah, no, I, I was I was always a drawer. Okay, I wasn't sure if there was yeah. the okay. It's regular work. I have to keep making these pages, and I'm getting well. I mean, it was an obsession with me. The reason I, I started doing it is because I couldn't stop doing it. Yeah. All right, so I was always, it's, you know, even even though sometimes drawing can be, it's very labor intensive, and it's uh, there's a lot of weird emotions that go on being a, an illustrator. But um, it's still like it's in a compulsion. So I yeah. I was always always doing it. Writing for other artists. Um, I have done that over the years. Um, it's something I, I love it. Yeah. Because I'm more of a, I'm more, even though I'm, I think I'm a pretty good artist. And, but I think I'm more, honestly, I'm more of a, even though most people will think of me more as an artist who writes, I'm actually a writer who draws. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
uh, I there's a certain uh, intimidation with knowing that you've, like I said, I got 120 odd pages of Godhead left to go. <laughs> That's daunting. But uh, if you told me I had to write, you know, you know, another script for Godhead, I'd be like, yeah. So I'm I'm actually uh, this year when I get back home, like this evening, starting tomorrow, I've got uh, I've got two scripts that I'm going to be writing for other artists to draw. Um, which I'm so thrilled by. When I approach the blank page, like on the screen, that's exciting to me. I'm not one of those writers like, I hate writing. I'd love to approach that blank page. Less so with uh, drawing, just because it's, it's seriously tough work. Um, yeah. Is it, is it that it's tough by itself or that you've already visualized it in terms of what you're writing? Exactly. This is just executing something exactly. you've already... Okay. Yeah. You can, I mean, for example, um, I write a scene, let's say... On, on a good day, I can pump out, let's say, uh, six pages of script. And by the and towards the end of the project, I'm I can't sleep. I'm just, I'm just writing, so I'll write like twelve pages in a day. All right, so let's say I write four pages of script in one day. Let's just lowball it. Those four pages of script that I've written are going to take me a month to draw. You know, weeks yeah. at least to draw. There's a differential there that's a little intimidating. You know, so. Um, yeah, is you've already put the work into creating the scene, and then you still have to do this other really labor-intensive thing. And it's not that, I mean, drawing is fun. It's very satisfying. Um, but I've often said what I really love is to, ha to, to have drawn rather than to actually draw. So for you, it really is in service of the script. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I, like, I'm a, I'm a visual storyteller. You know, it's, I've done, I've been an illustrator where it's all about just the image, but even then, I'm illustrating an article or something like yeah, that. Still, you know, I'm forming still, around a concept. Exactly. Yeah. I don't draw just to just to draw. Mm -hmm. And um, your your writing influences. You talked a bit, a bit about the comics side, right. and I'm sure there's a comics writing side. But you bet. Literary influences and the the, the writers who. Yeah. Um, mostly, mostly screenwriters. To be honest with you, yeah. um, I, I love to read novels. I love to read nonfiction. Um, Nonfiction is what kind of informs my work for the most part as a writer. Um, it's because I, I, I don't like to make stuff up. I like to research before I write. So I wound up reading like biographies and just, you know, a lot of like nonfiction. But uh, just as a, as a dramatist, as a stylist, uh, you know, writing stylist, I, I, really like, uh, I really like screenwriters. That's kind of my thing. I love, um, oh, wow, of course, now that I have to come up with names, I'm blanking. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, love, uh, I love David Mamet. Um, I love, uh, oh my God, Tarantino obviously is an amazing screenwriter. Francis Coppola was a big influence on me. Um, yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of screenwriters. And let me ask about the, the King work, to yeah. get back to the thing sure. that, that hounds you yeah. most. Uh, that's, thanks. <laughs> that sense of, of the person and not the myth, mm -hmm. uh, that you really focus on King right. as a human being. Right. Um, you think that, in a way, characterizes your work in general, sure. that, that sort of demythologizing yeah, of, of people, yeah, even yeah, yeah. while you're doing a, a long-form story about communicating with God? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, but it's down to earth, though. Yeah. Um, no, uh, with a heart. Yeah. 100%. No, I, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I mean, I had grown, what I knew about King was the myth of King, all right? It was never, it was never, uh, you know, it, none of the flaws were ever exposed mm -hmm. in, as I was coming up. Um, and I just have never, that is not inspiring to me. Um, what is inspiring to me is to know that somebody out there can mess up relentlessly. And I'm not saying this is a, the truth, King. I'm just saying that somebody can, out there can make copious mistakes and yet find a way to rise above them and to continue. That's inspiring. Somebody who never makes a mistake, never has an impure thought, whatever. Like, what have you got to overcome? What then? How do you? How does that person relate to the rest of us? Because I don't know anybody like that, and I'm willing to bet none of you people know anybody like that either. So I, it's just more interesting to me to like sort of see the underbelly, yeah. as it were. Well, that's why in our our childhoods we gravitated to Marvel instead of DC. I don't know if you did the same thing. I was more of a Marvel guy when I was a kid. Same now thing. More because Superman guy. isn't interesting in that era. You know what? I love Superman, but but, but in that era though, though it was just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and it really there was nothing. No, man. No, absolutely. Yeah, no. If I was going to do a Superman story, and I would love to, it would be Superman as, uh, you know, 
maybe not quite a, a Boy Scout, yeah. which is why DC would never let me right. <laughs> <laughs> put my hands on that character. And I've asked, trust me. Yeah. I'll take some questions from you guys. Anyone have a, a question for Ho? Come on, we got one at least. Hello, sir. <laughs> well, you started sort of talking about this, but with, with the King series, there is such a gigantic amount of information available. Talk a little bit about your process of getting from that gigantic amount of information right. to what you chose. Yeah, synthesizing oh all that. Yeah, that and was dramatizing uh, it, not just absolutely. boiling it down, but yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was intimidating. Um, I I. I um, I'd done uh, some work for uh, DC and for Milestone Comics, um, and I had uh, I had a huge stack of boards that I I sort of spirited away so I could work on on my own stuff. And I remember I stared at those boards for a long time, um, knowing that I was going to have to fill them up with stuff. It was it was kind of scary, and um, so at any rate, um, I you know, and I kind of avoided it for a little while. Um, it was, it was, you didn't, I didn't know what my end point was going to be. And um, eventually I just said, just start. So I just started reading. I read uh, everything I could get my hands on. I read, I read uh, one of the great sources was uh, Juan Williams. Uh, there was a great um, documentary series on PBS called Eyes on the Prize. Mm -hmm. Eyes on the Prize 1, Eyes on the Prize 2, and the, and the companion volume. Invaluable. Uh, so I started there, and then Gary Groth sent me uh, a couple of biographies, one called uh, Let the Trumpet Sound by an author named Stephen B. Oates. And, uh, and then I bought um, uh, Ralph uh, David Abernathy's book. Uh, I forgot the name of it now. It's been a while since, I, since I've thought of it. Um, it'll come back to me. At any rate, so I just started to read biographies uh, and autobiographies and material not so much about the civil rights era specifically, but um, just about the, the era itself. And uh, just trying to familiarize myself, just give myself a basic, you know, uh, sort of basic, uh, you know, bit of knowledge about, uh, about the era. Um, and then it was uh, tons of documentaries and gathering as much um, visual research as I could. So I spent about six months um, just, just researching. I mean, get up in the morning, research all day, go to bed, you know, just shove that knowledge into my brain, and then, and then before I felt, like, really comfortable to, like, start, okay, and now I know what I'm dealing with, and I can actually start to write. Um, so I, I researched for a solid six months. I don't know how I had the money to do that, but somehow I managed, <laughs> managed to, like, put food in my belly and then keep a roof over my head. And um, so I, uh, I did that for six months, and then I, I wrote for three months. It took me, it was like three volumes, and each volume took me like a month to write. And uh, so it was nine months, all right? And I was doing like jobs on the side, but it was like my, my primary focus for like the better part of a year was like, was creating Just the, the, was the just, research and writing? Just the research and the writing. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was, that was a moment. And then, uh, and then it was like another year and year and a bit to, uh, to draw the first volume. And then I started to get some real work as a cartoonist, uh, some like paying work, and then so that's kind of why, why it took such a long time to finish because, you know, however I managed to like keep myself going during that nine months, that evaporated, and then I really like needed to like make money, like for real, and uh, so you just and King just wasn't paying as much as it should have, so it wound up taking quite a long time. But um, I have to say, when I look back on it, it was. Uh, it was uh, kind of glorious to just be able to, like, you know, kind of just kind of stretch myself intellectually for that amount of time, you know, and uh, take such a deep dive into such an important subject because you don't always get that kind of opportunity to do that. You know, you were in your twenties at that point, so right? Early twenties. Yeah. yeah. See, I'm a, a year or two younger than you, and the energy we had then versus <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it tends to flag a little yeah, bit. Yeah, in our forties yeah. and fifties, not so much. But <laughs> absolutely. More questions. I'd imagine that like being able to create everything from scratch would be incredibly satisfying. So. Absolutely. Well, they, they, you know what they? Um, that's a good question. They, for me, they both stem from the uh, from the same place, um, and that is uh, what I looked about doing. What I looked about doing, like you know, this kind of fantasy comic books, sci-fi comic, and what I liked about 
doing Kang is that they're both about world building. Um, and I really love the fact that I was like trying to recreate the 1960s. Um, and it's a, a, but the thing is, as much fun as it is to create um, create your own world and create your own rules, um, I, there's something about uh, being able to take subject matter that I felt was like so rich and was about and so relevant, and unfortunately still so relevant. Um, there's a kind of a satisfaction that I got from doing that kind of work that is honestly absent from doing this kind of stuff. They're, they're satisfying in different ways. This way is I sort of get to play God, ironic, because it's called Godhead. But, uh, in, uh, and and that's, that's way cool. But I really like the fact that there's such rich themes that I got to kind of, um, and such relevant themes that I got to kind of you know, put my stamp on. Yeah. And unlike Chester Brown, you couldn't tackle the Louis Riel story. He already got into that one. So. You know what? Uh, Riel's fascinating. Not my world. Not yeah, my story to tell. That's what I figured. Yeah. Me, me and Chester actually did a panel together about 10 years ago or something like yeah. that. Um, eight or nine years ago where he talked about Riel. And, and it was it was interesting to see the difference in our work because uh, Re I felt, uh, and Chester kind of backed this up in that he he definitely wanted to tackle, you know, uh, the real, as it were, of, of Riel, but he also kind of wanted to soft pedal it a little bit so it was a little bit more palatable to people, whereas my stuff is very kind of in your face, you know. Uh, Chester would have never used the N-word, whereas I was like, that's what people said, so yeah, that is what's going to happen. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, you know, but the, if you're going to tell that story, <laughs> yeah. you cannot, like, step back from it. You, True. If you're going to do it, then do it. If you're not going to do it, then... If you're going to do that, if, if you feel uncomfortable about tackling it full on, then maybe you should pick another subject. That's what I feel. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense. More questions? And I love Riel, by the oh. way. That's not to, to denigrate yeah. uh, Chester's work in any way. It's a phenomenal book. Yeah, I, I know. You talked about art training. Did you have any like, formal history training? No, I'm history? total... Yeah, I'm an amateur historian <laughs> to, in, in every way. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I, yeah, you know what? I was going to say something else. I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to not get myself in trouble. Well, I've, I found it with a couple of biographers, especially comics biographers I've, I've um, recorded with over the years. A lot of them are first-timers, and they just sort of... And they're not going in, like deep into to primary material, so that some of them do that, too. That's a failing in my research, I'd say. It's tough. And, yeah. and again, that would have involved a lot more work and travel back and forth. It would have to, involved a time machine, to be yeah. honest with you. I don't have one of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, these guys keep having the, yeah, I decided I want to do a biography of this person because no one had done it. And yeah. then I discovered why no one had done it. And they, they kind of <laughs> had to be, teach themselves yeah. both being a historian and, you know. That's writing. one thing that I, I wish that I had done. I was uh, honestly, I was a little intimidated. Um, I did reach out to some people um, when I was doing my when I was doing my first research, but it was diff nobody took me seriously. It was a stupid cartoonist from Canada um, doing a comic book, so it's not real. Um, so nobody really wanted to give me the time of day. But I, I, I that's that's a re that's a regret. I really wish I could have sat down and really spoke with the players in the game and gotten their... Mm -hmm. So I'm a little jealous that Nate got to deal with John Lewis. Yeah. I would love to have sat down and have a conversation with John Lewis about the civil rights movement, but John Lewis did not want to deal, well, deal I, with I the was, likes of me. <laughs> I was once headed down for my, my day job. I was meeting with some congressional staff, and to do that, I have to get up at like 4 in the morning, get to the train station, get down to Washington. And it was the, uh, the day after John Lewis was calling a sit-in for uh, gun laws okay. at, in, uh, at Capitol Hill. Right. And so the staffers had emailed me at, at 2 in the morning saying, we're still down here. Is there any way you can, you can come down later in the day? Just right. send us an email and let us know. And I just wrote back, when John Lewis says it's time to sit in, you sit in. Hell yeah. I'll, I'll come down noon or, or 1 o'clock. <laughs> Don't worry. It's, that's, that's fine. John, but, John Lewis is meant. Yeah. Now, did you ever hear from any of King's family or any of the... Uh, did anyone yes. after the book, I mean? Yes. Uh, we got a very nastily worded cease and desist order from the King estate after the first volume was uh, published. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't care. I'm in Canada. You can't serve me with papers. <laughs> so I kind of read the letter and thought, oh, cool, this is going to look good in the archives. And I have filed it away and I haven't looked at it since. Um, and they never came after us. I thought that it was so nastily worded. I think I, perhaps their lawyers thought, you know. Uh, Intimidation gonna, factor. Exactly. Without actually. But I just didn't care. So it, it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I never heard anything other than that, though. Now, as far as being 
openly black. As, yes, as a yes, I am still openly black, <laughs> uh, Gil. Any <laughs> any issues? Did you come up with? Did you encounter any any either racism or weird pushes from from editors? No, no, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I the only editor I had to deal with was Gary Groth, and he yeah. was the one who commissioned the book in the first place. Right. So no, Planet Graphics has always been uh, very much behind the project and yeah. supporting me. If if things had gone. If things had gone, uh, you know, pear-shaped with uh, the King Estate, they would have yeah. been there to to buffer me. Well, I mean, with other other comics work, though, other did you ever feel did oh, you ever encounter anything that was? Uh, um, did you ever feel as though I didn't get that job? Yeah, yeah, for sure, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard some things um, through through secondary sources. You know, so and so was afraid you were going to bring too much black rage or whatever the <laughs> hell to to X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Uh, you know, and here's the thing. Uh, you know. You can't be a black person in, in North America without experiencing a certain amount of rage. It's the way it is, unfortunately. Um, it's the way you can't be a woman without, I would assume, without experiencing a certain amount of rage in this society. Um, but uh, So it's kind of inherent. But that doesn't mean necessarily that that is what I'm going to bring to every single project. I'm going to bring that to what it, where it's appropriate. But if I got hired to do a Batman comic book or a Superman comic book, as I so wanted to do earlier in my career, it would have been a Superman comic book. It wouldn't have been, you know, kill Whitey. It would have been, you know, <laughs> let's save Lois Lane or whatever the hell it would have been. But, uh, but yeah, so, yeah, I've definitely, definitely, I think it's, it's been a clear impediment in my career. Um, but... You know, I can't rub this off, man. It's there for life, and I and I want to tell stories. At least, at least some of my stories. I want to tell stories about what it's like to be the other in this society. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not that's not going to change. Gotcha. No more questions. So I'm sitting here in the room all day, off and on. So I'm seeing a lot of different creative people, and as a fan of both comics and movies and, and other media, um, I find it fascinating the creative process and where these things come from. So right. for you, where do your ideas come from or maybe how did they come to you? Um, wow, what yeah, a question. With something like Godhead, with, with some of the, the genre and crime stuff and the horror yeah. stuff you've done. You know, it's uh, from everywhere and nowhere. They're just, sometimes they're just sort of form, they just are there in your head fully formed. Usually it's, um, usually it stems in my case from Something that's bothering me, uh, either something that I'm, uh, you know, disturbed by in society, or something that I'm going through uh, in my personal life. For example, um, one of the two scripts that I told you about that I'm going to be writing soon is uh, uh, is a graphic novel called The Resurrectionists, um, and that is about a woman who. Uh, how can I describe the story? She is down and out on the streets of New York City in the 1880s, and she runs across a group of grave robbers who sell bodies to medical science. And then through doing so, she discovers that she has the ability to raise the dead. Uh, but she, can't, she can only raise the dead of people that she didn't know. She can't raise the, her, the people that she's loved. Yeah. And that stems from the fact that I'm just going through horrible grief at this point from, from having lost my wife a couple of years ago. And that story sort of formed into, uh, came into my brain fully formed. And that was a direct result of just needing to work on something that was going to allow me to process the, the pain I was going through. Um, but other stories just stem from, you know, police brutality is something that's a, a huge concern with me, unfortunately. Uh, it's still something that we need to deal with in, in our world. And... Uh, so I'm working on another project uh, I can't talk too much about, but it's a cop story, um, uh, a television thing. And, uh, and that just came directly from the fact that I just saw one too many people get the shit beat out of them or lose their lives for just existing by the cops. Um, so usually it's like something that's going on in the real world that I feel the need to talk about. But sometimes you just want to have a laugh and, you know, mm -hmm. so... Sorry, that's not a very good answer, but I mean, they just, they come from everywhere. There's ideas just floating around at all times. I think it was a good answer. <laughs> You're too kind. The uh, piece that you mentioned that you were coming up in the 1880s, yes. is that something that we should be looking for? That yeah, 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 that's, I'm super excited about this project. Um, is, that, uh, is that one you'll be drawing? No, I'm going to be working with a, a fantastic artist named Jeremy Love. Uh, he's going to be the illustrator on that. I can't wait to talk about it. I mean, and start working on it. Probably years? Yeah, probably about two years. It's probably going to take, I'm going to start writing it. Um, I've got to do a bunch of research. It's probably going to take me a few months to research it and then another few months to write it. 
and then it's all in Jeremy's hands, and he's pretty fast and pretty awesome, so I, I, probably about two, two and a half years from now. Yeah, yeah really excited about that project. I should ask a, a Toronto question. Your first yes. book, uh, I Want to Be Your Dog, takes so, place in, in Toronto. You bet it does. Anything since then? Uh, Except there? Yeah, you know what? That's funny because I, I really I one of the one of the things I set out to do when I when I started my career in comics was to kind of mythologize our city a little mm -hmm. bit, and unfortunately, it hasn't gone the way I wanted it to. Just in that, um, just you don't always get to choose the stuff that you want to do. You yeah. have to go where you can make some money and make a living. And uh, oftentimes, that has taken me outside of my kind of mandate to mythologize the city of Toronto a little bit. But I've done it here and there, certain projects. I did. Um, a short thing, it's sort of a sequel to I Want to Be a Dog called uh, Miles from Home uh, a few years ago. Um, and that was another story that took place in Toronto, but honestly, not as much as I would have liked to. And the movie that we just shot um, this past summer takes place in the city of Toronto and is very much about going back to trying to mythologize, um, mythologize the city and you know its aesthetics and its blah, 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 its rhythms, its culture. Yeah. Are we more likely to see, well, what are we more likely to see first, the movie or Resurrectionist? Uh, probably the movie. Okay, yeah. Good. I'm glad to see this, this <laughs> progress on the various artistic. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. stuff is stuff is in the way. I'm not sitting on my hands. I'm definitely uh, I'm cranking. I'm we look forward it. to more work. Awesome. And we should be able to come up and check out some of your art. If you're so uh, If you have any other questions for Hope, no. let's thank We've our. Done it. Our awesome. Guests, our thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. It's been a blast. Okay. But please come up and, and take a look at Godhead. There's some really neat pages in there. No pressure. Yeah, but uh, but the art style. I mean, like it's it's like Sue Co. At one point. Like, oh, cool! On, the, I love uh, Sue Co. Like at the beginning Deep of cut. Godhead, when you've got right. the you know the, the heavily shaded, and, right, 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 and, and then the real chicken esque stuff. Always. And, you know. and that was Hoche Anderson live at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. His new book is Godhead from Fantagraphics. You should check that out, along with his collected biography of Martin Luther King Jr., King, also from Fanta, as well as his other work there. And if you look him up online as, well, I'll spell his name in a minute, uh, you will find some of his non-Fantagraphics work, too. Oh, he's also, if you go to IMDb, in post-production on the movie Le Corbeau, which he wrote and directed. At least IMDb says it's in post. He does not seem to have much of a social media presence, which is for the best, as we've discussed before, but you can find Ho on Instagram at Hoche Anderson, all one word, and that is H-O-C-H-E-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. So Hoche, like Ho Chi Minh, Anderson, like uh, Mr. Anderson from uh, The Matrix. Now, my thanks again to Cartoon Crossroads Columbus for having me moderate Ho's Spotlight session. This was an awful lot of fun. And after we wrapped, I asked Ho, so, who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I'll get the third quarter 2019 episode up soon. I hope next weekend before I leave for Frankfurt, but no guarantees. Meanwhile, the second quarter episode features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Sotoropoulos, Caitlin Foisy, Seth, Nina Bunjavak, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessim. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one during Cartoon Crossroads Columbus Weekend, or CXC, in September. A uh, hotel was 560 bucks for two nights. Airfare was 550 Parking at Newark was about 100 Uh And so, spent a little money on coffee, a couple of meals, lift out to Ray Ray's Hog Pit and back. So, about 1300 bucks for the weekend. I did get in five podcasts from Friday afternoon till Sunday when I did this one as well as some really fun off-mic conversations that will probably lead to future episodes. So, eh, 
it all works out. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Lescamella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Ottaviani, George Fow, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, David Small, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at SoundCloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs>